Hey everyone, welcome to a very special 50th episode of SideQuest. I am the creator, producer, and co-creator of Fun and Games, the creator and producer of SideQuest, Matt, aka Stormageddon. I am joined by two very special guests. Hi, I'm Jeff Moonen. I'm the other creator of uh, the Fun and Games podcast and a proud member of the Certain POV Network and uh, very happy to be here for this special episode. Uh, and I am Nathan Brandt, uh, founder, editor, booking person, and general them about town uh, for Some Good Shows, a podcast network where we do a bunch of weird podcasts. And that's me. I am so excited to have you both here. Um, for episode 50, I wanted to do something a little special. We are talking about the game Shovel Knight, specifically the original release, Shovel Knight, Shovel of Hope, uh, a game that if you listen to the main show of Fun and Games, you know Jeff and I mention at least once per episode minimum, if not <laughs> more. And very recently, Nathan was on an episode of the Left Behind Games Club podcast, Friends of the Show, and talked about Shovel Knight. And so I thought it would be a great idea, instead of it just being me or Jeff or Nate talking about this game, that we'd have a little roundtable talking about one of the greatest 2D platformers to ever have been created. Um, and I'm not using hyperbole here when I say that. I know there are a lot of others that I really like, but I think for me, Shovel Knight just coalesced between soundtrack graphics, game design, story. It's just one of those complete packages that we don't see, especially in the sprite-based gaming space, because there's always some kind of, like, shtick with it. And there is a shtick to this, too, but I feel like it's just coalesced better than a lot of those other games. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Sh Shovel Knight is very much a success of the the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants because it's a game that evokes and it looks at the memories and sort of quote unquote common knowledge of how the NES worked the the old Nintendo Entertainment System of the late 80s early 90s while also being a game that could never actually run on that system but they looked to it as a design standpoint a thing to start from in choosing color palettes in their sprite design even in their in the composition of the music was done using that's probably the only part that could almost work on an NES because it used a Famicom tracker to use NES style chiptunes except it also didn't use those to make the sound effects that's getting a little technical but <laughs> those are those little choices that I really enjoy and showcase the amount of love that went into the creation of this project yeah i uh, like for me it's it's sort of a best of all worlds in terms of um nes side scrollers right you got ducktales you got mario 3 there's a little bit of mega man in there as well um castlevania with some of the um the weapons that you can swap out and use um in different scenarios and stuff like that and it's 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 it is a combination of all those things, but it is also, it's not necessarily beholden to any of those things. Like it's not, it's not like a rip off of any of those things. And it's not, you don't play it and you say, oh, this is good because it was good in a previous game. It's good because somebody appreciated that game and wanted to do, you know, uh, wanted to build on some of those experiences. And yeah, the color palette is like, it's close to the NES palette, right? Cause like- yes. And even Shovel Knight is is blue, and in my opinion, it's probably blue because the NES could do a lot of blues really well. That's why Mega Man is blue. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's 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 sort of what you remember those games being. You know, when you go back to them, you're like, oh, this doesn't actually look as good as I thought when I was a kid. But Shovel Knight is is sort of that like it looks as good as you remember that ideal memory of what an NES platformer was. And what I really think is interesting about Shovel Knight is it's had this really weird life cycle, right? It's been around for multiple generations and not a lot of indie games get to do that. You know, it's been on, re the release list is a little wild. So it's on Amazon Fire TV, which I didn't know, Microsoft yep. Windows, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo Switch, OS X, Linux, P PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, Wii U, and the Xbox One. That's wild to me to for it to have such a wide release. It's no wonder it's so popular. But I think also there's a malleability to it. You know, like we're talking about, it's designed to look like a Nintendo game, 
but better. And so it could have never run on that system. Its ubiquity is, I think, in part because of how it was designed. And I mean, we mentioned DuckTales before. I think the key thing that a lot of people latch onto with the gameplay of this game is the shovel hop. The fact that you can jump on enemies with your shovel pointed down to kill them, which is very reminiscent of Scrooge McDuck's cane in the mm -hmm. original DuckTales. And there's something satisfying to that kind of bouncy tactility of, if that's a word, if not, I made it up, of, <laughs> of that attack. And that kind of carries the weight of the game. But Nate, you made a good point. Like, I didn't even think about it being compared to Castlevania, but all of the yeah. sub weapons, especially the ones that allow you to traverse in a certain way, are very much like Castlevania. Yeah. It's got yes. this legacy that I didn't even occurred to me that even goes further than just the base NES. That anchor weapon is just straight up the throwing axe from yep. Castlevania. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of motion that goes on in the game, whether it's that very like sine wave motion of floating enemies, the way certain relics move, those are all, you know, the window dressing may change and their effect might be a little different, but yeah, they're all very evocative of trajectories, of motion, of bursts of speed that we have felt a dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times in their originators and in all of the permutations that have come since. As well as the fact that all of the, the retro talk here, Shovel Knight also brings in a lot of what we've learned about game design and what we've moved past from NES. Yeah. A lot of NES games would be built on arcade ideals having a certain number of lives, a certain number of continues, get a high score, and high scores will get you more lives. All of that is done away with and sort of wrapped up into one thing, and that's treasure. And yep. we, as, you know, we get points not necessarily to get points. Some do. But the treasure in this game is your life system. It is your upgrade system. It is all of those things, and it is also the beginning of... One of the things I love about playing Shovel Knight, which is you can engage with it on as challenging or as easy of a level as you want. You can explore as much as you need to, and there's nothing you necessarily need to turn on, but it will automatically do. Uh, I don't think this was in the original release, but they've had a very robust update schedule that's gone on since Shovel Knight's 2014 release that there is a sort of built-in speedrun mode where uh, the thing that is most easily evocative of Mario 3 is the way you choose stages. You move yeah. around on a sort of segmented map that you yeah. unlock when you beat levels. But there are also, much like Mario 3, little wandering one-on-one -on -one fights that can happen, a la the Hammer Brothers. But if you reach a certain point in the game with a playtime under, I believe, 14 minutes, they don't show up. So if oh. you are trying to speedrun the game, you it removes a random element and something that is meant to create a living breathing world as you slowly explore if you're gunning for it they make it a little easier for you you don't have to turn on speedrun mode you don't have to choose that if it is below a certain time that happens when huh. you the in in playing through the game there are checkpoints throughout the levels that you know you will die a lot it's challenging it's meant to be and because you don't have limited continues, it's fine. When you die, you lose a little treasure. If you can make it back there, maybe get the treasure, don't die while you're doing it. But you can also destroy the checkpoints, get more <laughs> treasure. Yeah. And that's taking on challenge for yourself. You're not choosing easy, medium, hard with any of the emotional baggage that might have. Mm -hmm. You are making these choices on the fly. If you feel confident about a level and you just want more treasure, destroy the checkpoints, whatever. You, you take that onto yourself, and I absolutely love that. Uh, again, these sort of easy pick with instant, I don't want to say payoff or consequences, but a bit of both that wouldn't be possible, I don't know how long, like when that became a thing that was much easier, but it also plays into what we wanted to do with NES games. We tried to hit everything we could, we tried to jump on everything, and now something happens. Right. Yeah. And, and like, you know, again, with the Castlevania, like, you know, going at a wall that you think might have something inside of it. Like if you if you have that sort of like Donkey Kong Country, like mindset when you're playing um, Shovel Knight, it, it definitely yeah. it definitely pays off to to get some some extra treasure and stuff like that, too. And uh, 
Yeah, no, the, the skill floor isn't super low. Like, it's still a difficult game, but you can raise the skill ceiling as you, um, as you like, which is, which is really cool. And I, I like that. And it's, you know, it's, it's, that system is like compared to Dark Souls because everything in video games is at some point <laughs> compared to Dark Souls. <laughs> yup. But I haven't seen like a game like Dark Souls just have the, like the courage to be like, what if you could get rid of the bonfire? What if you could get rid of the lantern and see, you know, how tough you really are and how good yeah. you really are at this game. And so I think that's super, it's another example of like, you know, they, they take, they take inspiration from other games, but they also build on it in a way that is like necessarily a component of this game. Like it's a very sort of like the best cartoons and video games and whatever. It's like its own succinct world. Like you understand, like you go into town and you're like, oh, there's horse people. Cool. I, I yeah, sure, whatever. Why not? Uh, like this. Yeah. This is weirdly like an economy built on knights, different kinds of knights, just going around and doing things. It's very interesting in that way. Um, and I guess story-wise, like I actually think Shovel Knight has one of the best stories in video games. I am a believer in that if you're gonna have a story in your video game, it needs to necessarily link into the gameplay or be, for some reason, it needs to be a story told through games. That's at least the best way to have a story in games. And Shovel Knight is definitely one of those because Shield Knight is mechanically very helpful to you. So by the time you're at the end, you know, you've gone through all of those um, um, save her, catch her moments or them or whatever, because you can change the genders of any of the characters in this game too. By the time you get to the end and you're fighting the Enchanter slash Enchantress, when you get the Shield Knight like boost, you're like, this is this is why they were a team. Yeah. This is so you understand that you know. Oh, these these people were you know. You can you could infer that they're um, romantically involved, but at minimum, you're like this is why they were like such a great team. Like that opening shot where it shows Shield Knight and Shovel Knight, and they're like you know doing like a cool action pose, and it's like <laughs> you know it's like like once long ago there was champions that you know blah blah blah. And you're like, yeah, I believe that. I believe that there was this golden age of at least Shovel Knight's life where they were just doing crazy awesome adventure stuff with Shield Knight and that they were a team and Shield Knight not being there is like completely like a detriment to Shovel Knight's life. And that's why he went into like, he became a farmer after <laughs> Shield Knight left or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and just stuff with Polar Knight too. Like mm -hmm. the fact that he uses a shovel too and there's like a weird like kind of inferred backstory there that you can kind of uh, you can kind of build in your head what that might be i i love that kind of stuff in games where it's just a very simple thing and the stuff with um the black knight too yeah. where you can just uh in your head sort of intrinsically you understand what the story might be there and they don't have to spell it out they don't have to give you miles of text or whatever to to tell you exactly what you already know by looking at it so i think that's really cool yeah, yeah, the designs of the characters are extremely strong. Mm -hmm. There is dialogue within the game, but it doesn't take much between animations, design, and the words used. You know a lot about these, about the Order of No Quarter, the eight knights you fight throughout this game, just by, just through design. Shovel Knight is a little more of a blank slate, but Shovel Knight's design is also extremely simple, chosen and fantastic it's why shovel knight has made for a lot of excellent crossovers in other games well there is a playable character an appearance you don't have to perfectly ape all of the bits and pieces it's armor you just need a horned boba fett t visor helmet and maybe the shovel which the 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 t and the the chest plate of shovel knight make a shovel uh, yes, they which do. Is like, oh my god, I never noticed that. They do. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice that until I saw a tweet from one of the developers, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> all, the, all the little choices. And yep. so Shovel Knight's helmet can show up as part of some dungeon merchant's uh, wares, and they don't have to make a big deal out of it, and it's it's already there. And now I, I think there's something fantastic in all of the different designs of the characters. You get... You learn so much about them as part of the gameplay, as part of exploring the world without having to go through walls of text. It's yeah. good conveyance. 
but th that said, the text in the game is really great too. The writing in mm -hmm. this game, and even though we're not covering the other campaigns, the other campaigns also just fill out this world just based on the writing because it's all text. There's no VO, and it's just so masterfully done. And what I love about the world of Shovel Knight is that they they don't they there are moments where they take everything seriously. Like Shovel Knight's devotion to Shield Knight is a hundred percent played serious. There's no mm -hmm. gag to it. But then the interactions with the, you know, the Order of No Quarter, and interactions with the townspeople, there's tons of humor there. The Bard, or Bard Knight, I guess. Like, right. the, the, because everyone's a knight in this world. Mm -hmm. um, like, all of that stuff is not only designed, but written so well. And there's something to how this world feels so real because of that. Because, you know, a lot of folks like to look at older games and be like, well, there's no voice acting. There's no FMVs or cutscenes. Like, it's not the same. And, and I'm inclined to disagree. I mean, one of my favorite games of all time, Chrono Trigger, which I mentioned everywhere, has no VO. And it doesn't need it because once you've played that game enough because of the writing, you hear the voices. You create your yeah. own voices. And Shovel Knight absolutely did that for me. Like, I, I picture for Polar Knight this husky, like, kind of Vin diesel -y deep voice when yeah. they're talking, you know, whereas Mole Knight might be like a little more like wild because, mm -hmm. he, you know, they can dig underground and they're kind of erratic. Like, it's just, I, I love being able to picture that and the writing absolutely takes you there. You don't need the, the voice acting or anything else to get it there because it's so masterfully crafted to begin with. Yeah, and the the music also like the the it's the it's either Requiem for Shield Knight or Shield Knight's Requiem, whatever. Um, in those dream sequences, when you're um, increasingly over time, and this is tying in with the the story stuff that I said earlier, like as you're playing the game, there are more and more enemies that show up in that that space, and more and more like treasure to distract you and stuff like that, and it like. It weirdly, like you said, like Shovel Knight is a, is pretty much a blank slate, but it gives you that little window into like what's going on with them, and uh, the the music in general, Jake Kaufman and uh, Maname Matsumi's yep. music in this game is it's so good. It's in that tier of like sort of like Undertale, where it's like, well, I'm just gonna put this soundtrack on while I do stuff, and like. I'm gonna think yeah. about the game as I listen to this, and when Shield Knight's Requiem comes up, I'm gonna get a little bit misty-eyed because it's so good on its own. Yeah, it's very telling that one of the few collectibles within the game that have really nothing to do with augmenting your uh, play experience, whether that's uh, armor upgrades or relics or anything like that, are is the soundtrack. You collect music pages by going off the beaten path and exploring the levels. You bring them to the digital avatar of Jake Kaufman in, as the bard, and then you can just listen to it. Then you can just play it. You do get a monetary reward, so there is a little bit, but it's very telling that it's one of those other things where it's just like, live in this experience, be a part of this world that has so many of these loving details. Well, yeah, and the soundtrack, I mean, I have a favorite song, I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite song, right? They're all really good, and they're really all um, set really strongly to the game. And something I've said about other movies that I love and other games that I love, if you can picture the game or the movie when you're listening to the soundtrack, you know it's made well. And, like, for me, Strike the Earth, the stage, the stage theme for the first stage, there's mm -hmm. something to that energy and that power that really just gets me going. And actually, DJ Cutman did a remix of a Mega Ran song using that theme and like remixing it a bit, but using Jake Kaufman's original um, composition. And like, I love that. I love that kind of adaptability for the music. But what I didn't realize also until recently re-listening, because I haven't replayed through the base game in a while, is that not only does each stage have a theme, but each boss fight with each knight has a separate theme that's connected to the theme of the stage. Like they have mm -hmm. similar themes, themes of music, not the theme music. Mm -hmm. to be specific right um, yeah like like they bleed together in a way but they're still their own pieces and like there's so much music in this game there's music mm -hmm. that you can miss by not doing certain mini games like it's just astonishing to me all of the stuff that was created for this and then additional things added for the additional campaigns that we'll cover probably on a later episode of side quest like it's just mind-boggling how much work went into this music and like Jeff said early on, it sounds like something out of the Nintendo, Super Nintendo era, but it absolutely could not run on, on any of those systems due to the complexity of it. But 
it all like there's not a song on the soundtrack that I can think of that doesn't just bring me back to want to play the game like every time I hear it and and it's very comparable to Undertale which you mentioned earlier Nate like that's another game that like when I hear Megalovania for the f- first like anywhere at any time I'm like oh I gotta go back and play this game and I mm-hmm. think Shovel Knight absolutely does that whenever I hear the music anywhere I'm like oh I haven't played in a while I should go back and play this game and it's very funny that we we've talked so much about all of the the sort of digital verisimilitude of this game with very little note to just, yeah, it's a great game to play. Yeah, the video game is good. (laughs) The video game is good. It's got tight platforming. It's challenging in a way that you want to keep trying it because of all of those like dynamic difficulty choices. it, It feels like there are very few cheap shots in the game and very rarely... I don't think ever did I run into a thing where it's like I, I blamed the controller or anything else. Like, you screw up, you die. Well, that's on me. Mm-hmm. You, the patterns are learnable, if sometimes complex. The, the challenges and stage hazards are all assailable and doable, and it is Shovel Knight moves at the right kind of speed to, to, that just feels good in your hands. As as we mentioned before, the 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 downward thrust, the Zelda two Ducktales shovel bounce, it's got the right kind of like bounciness to it. It's all of those little choices that we weren't talking much about them because it's almost like we take them for granted because it's so well, it feels so good to control and play that you don't even notice that you are able to notice everything else around you because you're not cursing the gameplay in the way you might a an, an older NES title that is just trying to squeeze out, um, you know, it's, it's a fake difficulty that's trying to get as much playtime out of you by giving you a 20 minute game that is impossible to beat. It's, yeah. that's another way that this game has evolved and just is so refreshing to play. Speaking of like the evolution of this game, you know, in, award shows like Game Awards or um, in, in a lot of other like games awards shows, there's recently been the, the award of best ongoing game. And usually it's like Fortnite, Overwatch, PUBG, and like maybe one other game that maybe released the year before, but is still going on. Mm-hmm. And I think up until like last year, you could have put Shovel Knight and probably should have put Shovel Knight in there because, you know, I, I bought Shovel Knight for the Wii U the day it came out. And so I have all the DLC on that on my Wii U. Yeah. And like up until recently uh, with the King of Cards and the um, the uh, Smash Bros like. Yeah, the showdown. <laughs> showdown. That's what it is. Yeah. That was in that Shovel Knight was an ongoing game and we don't think of that as being in the same kind of thing as like Overwatch or whatever. But every time I saw those awards um, being announced, I'm like, well, Shovel Knight's not on there. And it definitely, definitely should be. I I think that their dedication to their promise in the original Kickstarter has been really awesome. And it it puts a lot of faith in Yacht Club games to um, like, I, I, I will wait as long as I need to for an official like done by them Shovel Knight sequel whatever it's going to be, whether it's Shovel Knight 2 or whether it's Shovel Knight 64, which they've joked about, um, <laughs> which which would absolutely rule. <laughs> oh, I oh, love yes. it. Yeah, like that. I have faith that whatever they're going to do, um, they're going to put their like they're going to put their back into it. And it's going to be as good, if not better, because they've learned from all of this stuff. You know, there was criticism with, I believe, um, with the first the um, what is it? Uh, the Plague Knight campaign. Plague of Shadows. Yeah, nights, yeah. Um, there was there was some complaints about like the traversal and that, and that it wasn't it quite as good. And then they did Spectre of Torment, and their like the the mechanic of moving around and that is awesome. And then in the the King Knight one as well, uh, King of Cards, like the traversal and that is like very Wario esque, which is, yeah, which is weird. Well, it's the whole treasure collection coming home to roost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like if you don't like the card battle part of it, you only have to do a couple of those man- mandatory. Um, but it, it that and another another thing that they've drawn from another game, which is like basically the triple triad game from from Final Fantasy eight and nine. There were card games that were exactly like um, the King of Cards thing. I know we're all we're pretty much talking about Shovel of Hope, but 
in general, they, they keep taking things from other games and being like, well, what would it be like if we did this? And they work it in in a way that that makes sense and it fits the, the card mechanic, in my opinion, fits just as much as the, the downward shovel thrust. Yeah. yeah, they incorporate and innovate. Yeah. Like, I, I know that we're just covering Trevor Hope as well, but I I would be remiss if I didn't put in a few words because I've played through all the campaigns and, like, they're all different. They're all different games, and I think that's why we're covering Shovel of Hope, because Shovel of Hope is the Shovel Knight core game, but all of it feels core to the entire experience, and maybe at some point in a later episode we'll cover the Battle Chest, which is the full release with DLC that you can buy that comes with everything. But each yeah. character, like like Plague of Shadows, Spectre of Torment, and King of Cards could have easily been thrown away campa- uh, palette swap campaigns where you just play as a different knight on the same stages with no story changes. Maybe one mechanical difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And people probably still would have played it, but they didn't do that. They redesigned the main character that you're playing as and created new narratives, prequel stories for Plague of Shadows and Spectre of Torment, and then an alternate, or no, for uh, Spectre of Torment and King of Cards, and then Plague of Shadows is like an alternate timeline. Yeah. And like all of them are, you know, again, like everything else in this game, perfectly handcrafted to deliver a different experience. And I think that that's what's really striking to me about Yacht Club Games and why I will probably buy anything they ever release forever is because there seems to be a level of care with this game that, I absolutely expect from both Shovel Knight Dig and uh, Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon, which are two other games with different mechanics that are being co-made with other studios. And 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 I'm sure eventually we'll get a Shovel Knight 2 to some degree, right? Like, I have to imagine that Yacht Club Games is already planning something. But Yeah, they put out a survey a while ago about, like, what would you want to see from a, another Shovel Knight game? And, of course, I put my vote for Shovel Knight 6. Sorry, continue. <laughs> no, but like that's just the thing is like they want to engage with the audience. They've created this right ra- like not a lot of Kickstarters, I feel like, create this kind of relationship from the beginning and then with their audience even after it's released. There are others. I feel like Bloodstained has done everything it can to try and do right by those Kickstarter backers, even though there have been problems. But I feel like Shovel Knight has really engaged, and Yacht Club Games has really engaged with their audience on a level that a lot of other developers haven't. And I'm just really excited to see whatever they do next, you know. But until then, every time I replay this game, it's still fun, it's still fresh, in the same way that replaying old Nintendo games or old SNES games. Like, I've played Donkey Kong Country, I don't know, 15 times. Let's be generous. Right. And like, mm-hmm. but every time I play it, I'm still excited to find that first hidden cave. I'm so excited to find Diddy that first time. Like, I still love that game. And that's another game where it's like David Wise, uh, with Grant Kirkhope's assistance, was like, it's one of the best soundtracks in the Super Nintendo generation. So like, I think what really for me, kind of wrapping up my thoughts on Shovel Knight, and we'll all go around. Like, this game is the total package. The reason I love this game and I never shut up about it is. It has everything to make a game good. And like I've mentioned other favorite games like Chrono Trigger and Mass Effect on the main show. And those games are good too, but they like Mass Effect is not a perfect game, even though it's one of my favorite games. But I would argue that Shovel Knight is a perfect game. If you like a 2D side-scrolling action platformer, it's got the perfect music, the perfect gameplay, the perfect story, the perfect design. Like, I can't think of any flaws with this game. And, you know, there are it's rare to get a game that you love so much that you can't, like, you don't have to make excuses for. Like, I still right. love the first Devil May Cry, but that is a badly made game. Like, it's fun to play, but like compared to Devil May Cry 5, it's clearly the superior game. It takes what they were trying to do then and actually executing it. Where Shovel Knight, I don't know that they, in a sequel, could do better. They would just have to do more of the same or go into a different genre completely. Like, imagine a Shovel Knight turn-based battle, like, strategy game or a RP- JRPG. Like that was, that was one of the things that was in the survey, too, is like, would you want us to do an RPG? And I'm like, uh, yeah, also, <laughs> yes. Yes, please give me that. <laughs> give me Shovel Knight timed hits. I want it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Pa- like, paper Shovel Knight, yeah. Uh, um, but, but... 
it's just one of those games that I think for me, like it didn't register as a favorite game until I realized how much I talked about it. Because it's very easy to choose games from your past, both recent and distant past, to be your favorites, right? We all we all go there because it's what we latch memory onto. But I think as far as modern games go, sh modern finger quotes, because mm -hmm. it doesn't represent what modern games look like to a degree. But a certain kind of modern game, yes. That's true. It's just become one of my favorite games because I just feel like it's flawless execution of the final product in a way that a lot of other games don't get right. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it, I, I'm not necessarily going to go with perfect or whatever else. It is an, a fantastic example. It is an exemplary game. Where it shows up for me is how easy it is to recommend. There are a lot of games where it's like, do you like this genre of game? Do you like this type of game? What sort of thing? How do you like to interact with games? There are, of course, gamers who aren't for the side-scrolling platformer. But for a lot of people, that is part of your gaming history. That is part of your gaming DNA. Even if you haven't played one since 1991, it's it's still in there with you. You know, you, you still know Looney Tunes even if you haven't watched it since you were five. And so, which is why all those evocative things work. And I mean, Matt, you first played this because I recommended it to you and and lent, and lent you my 3DS copy. And the and that's another way that it quietly snuck up on me as a, yeah, I love this game. It is the top of my list. Like it's not, I have to decide when not to recommend it versus when to recommend it because of what a great example of what the, of what it is. It is a fantastic, modern-ish side-scrolling platformer. It is, and because of, you know, to get really punny here, uh, however deep you want to dig into it, that's the experience you get out of it. And that's, that's rare. Right, yeah, like the, uh, the, the Shovel of Hope is, you could say that it's one-fifth of the game, but in, like, whether you're, whether or not you'd say that it's perfect, it, you would probably give it like a 10 out of 10. Like there's not, pr yeah. there's not really much that you would, that you would want out of it. And, you know, obviously 10 out of 10 doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's absolutely perfect, right? But but everyone should try it. Yeah, exactly. But that's that's one of the, there's three other campaigns on top of that. And then there is a fighting game on top of that as well. So it's, it's like, uh, like I haven't delved too much into the other uh, campaigns because like I said, it's on my Wii U <laughs> I have those. So it's, it's a little bit more effort to get that out there. But, but yeah, no, the, the base game shovel of hope when I was on left behind game club, like you, uh, like you mentioned earlier, one of the hosts like wasn't super keen to play shovel Knight, but they did for this, for that episode of the podcast. And they came out of it saying like, wow, that was, that was really good. I don't, I don't normally, you know, normally like retro looking games, aren't my thing 2d games really aren't my thing um but this one really really and as as we age and gamers come younger and younger to us um this is a game that you can recommend to them and say like this is the kind of stuff that we were playing but this is the best version of that you know from back in the day this is uh, going back to Mega Man 2, probably not super fun for your first time in 2020, right? Like, <laughs> whereas like I would I would jump in and be like, all right, Woodman, let's go, right? But yeah, some, somebody else may not want to play that. But Shovel Knight, Shovel of Hope, you can say like, you know, play this. This is a retro game, and it's and it's going to be good. And I think maybe other than the first Inti Creates Bloodstained game, Circle of the Moon. Like those, yes. that oh, one yes. and and this are like those are the like quote unquote retro games that I would that I would show people to get that kind of like perfect flavor of what it is without any reservations like you were saying right I don't have to say well there's a password system and well there isn't any checkpoints in there yeah. or <laughs> well it's way too hard because you know you know it was back in the day and we were transitioning from arcades so lives were something you had to deal with. No, it's it's just a good game that you can recommend like no holds barred. You can just say like, I yeah, know this is this is a uh, I would call it a perfect game. I would call it a perfect game because there's yeah. there's nothing for me that I would say I want more from it. But at the same time, too, uh, as you as I keep playing it, um, there are things that I find to enjoy about it 
more and more like um, propeller night stage being almost like completely vertical. You can fall from <laughs> almost the top down to the bottom. Like they all they all build on each other. And it's got that very Mega Man style uh, conveyance where it shows you something like very easy to go over. And then it like builds on that and builds on that. And then it builds on more things. And then the end, you have this gauntlet of like the wind and the propeller thing and all of this other stuff. So you can you can dig in and enjoy the, the level design, the like really subtle level design stuff. And then on top of that, when you see that little rat with the helicopter, that's the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, it's delightful. <laughs> that's, it's that's the best part of the game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we can all agree that Shovel Knight is one of the greatest 2D platformers ever mm -hmm. made, and I'm so excited that uh, both of you joined me for this kind of extended version of side quests. This is a series that I've poured my heart and soul into. It is all stemmed from what the thesis of the show is. People talking about games that they love and why they love them. There's no caveats there's no well it's not a good game but uh, you know i've had people talk about games that were panned you know talk about games that publicly have a terrible you know whatever look or whatever it's just i want people there's so much irrational hate for games that he haven't even come out yet like the newest paper mario that people crapped on before it even it, like it was even playable like that kind of hate in the games industry drives me crazy. And so to have a series where people can just unabashedly talk about why they love something is so important to me. And it was so important to me to have both of you to talk about this game that we unabashedly love. So um, I'm going to let y'all plug in just a sec. Everyone knows where to find me. I am at AKA Stormageddon. Um, I produce this show. I am part of Fun and Games with Jeff. I do a ton of other shows over on CertainPOV.com. You can go to DJStormageddon.com to find everything that I do. But, you know, just thank you sincerely to everyone listening to this. Thank you to everyone who has done an episode of this. And thank you to everyone who will yet to do an episode of this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I would like to continue Matt's uh, sincere thanks for joining us on this journey yeah i i i handle the production on on our uh on the fun and game side of things our every other friday show and the side quest has been such a wonderful uh evolution on that and it's been so great seeing the love that everybody has for for games and for gaming and that's it is very much what we are about uh, you can find me on uh, every other Friday on Fun and Games, and you can find me on Twitter at Jeff G E O F F makes noise. Um, I I stream at not Jeff at all. That's Jeff with a J because that's the easier one to spell for people. And <laughs> and I'm all about. And you can find me at Victory Position on Twitter, uh, and you can also search in any podcast app or site, service, whatever, for some good shows, all one word, and we literally have eight podcasts, some of them seasonal, some of them regularly occurring. We just started one um, that is like a recap and analysis show on My Hero Academia, which is more of our our traditional, I would call that our, our normal podcast, right? It's like, a, like an hour and a half of people talking about something, and it's not like a a weird high concept half hour thing that we do <laughs> but yeah no and, and thanks for having me like doing the the my episode on Fortnite was really cool it came at a time when i was like really 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 hot on that game and i was like i was i, I would have done that podcast for myself to listen to for myself let alone <laughs> let alone put it out <laughs> for someone else so that's really cool and if you haven't done one on last guardian i would love to come back and, and talk about how last guardian is actually <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey. We haven't, and consider <laughs> yeah, right. yourself on the list. But yeah, no, you can find me at Victory Position on Twitter, and uh, at Some Good Shows on Twitter is our podcast network where we have myriad shows about myriad things. Yeah, if you haven't checked out Some Good Shows yet, please do. I've been a guest on the New Entertainment System podcast, uh, which is one of the greatest high concept. <laughs> it's so podcasts cool. On the planet, <laughs> thank you. Making up stupid shit in the best way, and then of course the 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 one that I want to pitch. Because I I am so excited about it and it doesn't come out till next year, but mm. it is called Found Family and it is a TTRPG actual play podcast in the Fast and the Furious universe and it is just it is just <laughs> gonna be I say this with all the love the dumbest thing ever in the best way and I'm so for, excited for, for me it's like I I don't like a whole lot of tabletop RPG stuff because I don't like all the math and the magic stuff and whatever. It's just like, let's run some cars into each other. <laughs>
Vroom, boom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, this has been a very special episode of Side Quests about the incredible game that is Shovel Knight. And remember, as always, happy gaming.